with the other. Okay, so what that means, this is actually a crucial insight of, of Cantor, was that you don't have to count the things. You can just see if you can put them in one-to-one -one correspondence. So, so, for instance, I don't have to do any counting at all to know that there are more chairs, in, there are more seats in this room than there are people. Why? Well, I just note that every person is paired off with a seat and there are some left over. So the cardinality of the set of chairs is greater than the cardinality of the set of people, to put it in a, a, a nerdy set theory talk, right? But I don't have to sort of count the chairs, then count the people, and note that the number of chairs is greater than the number of people. I can just do the one-to-one -one correspondence. And what's interesting about this, this will work for infinite sets. You don't have to actually count them as long as you can pair them off. So, just to get a feel for how this connects up with the power set stuff, remember the cardinality, we write these little lines here. I, I should, th those of you who don't like symbols, don't worry about this too much. The, this is just me you know, showing my nerdy streak. Uh, but the basic idea is quite simple, that the size of the power set is the size of this thing, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, we already established. So the cardinality of the power set here is 4, from our previous example. The set that we started with, the set that contained just 0 and 1, the cardinality of that is 2. And interesting that the cardinality of the power set is 2 to the 2, which is greater than 2. Okay? That turns out to be a very, very deep and generalised, generalizable result. Which brings us to Cantor's theorem. He showed that if you've got some set and the, the cardinality of the set, so if you've got some set certain size, that's what it means, you've got some size kappa for the set, then the power set will be 2 to the kappa. And, here's the kicker, 2 to the kappa is always greater than kappa. Okay, so what does that mean? It means if you've got a set and you form the power set of it, then the size of the second set, the power set, will always be bigger than the first. Okay, we just saw that in that one little example. Not so startling, you might think. Think about this case. What if the first set is infinite? Form the power set of the natural numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to infinity. There's infinitely many of them. The power set of the natural numbers is infinite, but it's a bigger infinity than the natural numbers. Right? Uh, do it again. Take the power set of that, another infinity, bigger than the, either of the previous two, and so on and so forth. Power set operation is always licensed in mathematics. You can always take power sets of any set. If you've got one infinite set, you've got infinitely many of them, and they're you know, stretching out infinitely many sets larger and larger than each other. Uh, and this leads to all sorts of strange puzzles. I won't go into them, but people were really worried about this. You know, the whole idea of infinitely many infinities is all, if that's not sort of disturbing you enough already, all sorts of, sort of puzzles you can get. How many natural numbers are there? Okay, let's call, for our argument's sake, let's call that number A of zero, as mathematicians do. How many even natural numbers. Every second one, 2, 4, 6, 8. Clearly there's less of them, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to, to infinity. Now only every second one, you're leaving out half of them. 2, 4, 6, 8, right? How many of them are there? A of 0 again. The same number. They're both infinite sets, but that's not what makes one set larger than another, is not even leaving out half of them, for instance. There's something else. It's the power set operation that does this. So this cute little trick that Hugh, I think it goes back to Hilbert. Imagine you've got an infinite hotel, infinite number of rooms in it, and it's full. Business is good, right? If you're a hotel owner, it doesn't get any better than that. Infinite, infinite number of rooms, and, and you know, the, the, the rugby league grand final is on, so everybody's there, it's, it's full. Someone else knocks on the door and says, I'd really like a room. First temptation is to say, sorry, we can't fit you in, we're full. But then the owner says, no, 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 we can. I'll move the person in room one into room two, the person in room two into room three, the person in room three into room four, and so on. Now room one's vacant. We've got a room. You can do that. That's one of the results, the sort of odd results you get with infinity. You can always make room for another. 
So, this is the, ba- this is the background. Here are, here are sort of the worries that uh, were permeating the mathematical culture of the time. Various responses, one of which most famously by one of the, the all-time greatest mathematicians, David Hilbert, Hilbert had this program to set mathematics straight because everybody was worried. So what he thought was that the the infinite stuff, unlike some people who wanted to chuck it out, that that crazy stuff about infinitely many infinities, let's try and restrict mathematics to more sensible things. Finitism, for instance, was a view. You can have only finite sets, but for every finite set there will be a bigger finite set, but no infinities, no completed infinities, if you like. Hilbert didn't like that. He thought he loved what Cantor had done. He'd loved the, the, the infinite mathematics. It was, it was truly beautiful, one of the greatest creations of, of uh, human thought. He didn't want to, to lose that. So he thought what we will do is we've got a good enough grip, modulo a few twists and turns, but we don't need to go into that. We've got a good enough grip on the finite mathematics, so what we want to do is sit the infinite stuff on top of it but treat it quite differently. The infinite stuff will be just a kind of this formal game. When you've got a symbol like that, you can replace it with a symbol like that. That's just a rule of mathematics. So we treat it like you do with the rules of chess, for instance. What is a rook in chess? Well, it's nothing other than the thing that plays the role of the rook. It's governed by certain rules. It doesn't matter whether it's made of wood, made of paper, made of porcelain, whatever. A rook is just that thing that plays the rook role. Hilbert thought mathematics is a game just like chess. There are manipulations you're allowed to make and that's what keeps it on the straight and narrow. All we need to do then... um, Mathematics is a kind of logical consequences. That's all you're doing, fleshing out logical consequences. Which prompted Bertrand Russell uh, to say (laughs) mathematics may be defined as a subject in which we never know what we're talking about nor what we're saying is true because you're just manipulating symbols, you're playing this formal game. He wanted to preserve the rich, infinite character of mathematics. As I said, he wasn't going to get rid of any of it. He'd need to make a story about how the infinite stuff fitted in and he thought of it as a formal game akin to chess. Famously, Hilbert said, no one shall expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. He would not have any truck with the the idea that we sort of restrict mathematics. We want as much of it as we can. This is, you know, uh, 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 Hilbert's respect for for the, the whole of mathematics. But to do this, and here's where we get back to Gödel, to do this, Hilbert required to prove that mathematics was consistent. And also that it was complete, that you can do everything by this method. If you treat it as a formal game, that you want to be able to crank out the theorems by playing this formal game. That's all you do. You have no other access to truths of mathematics except by cranking through deductions. And that cranking through the deductions will not land you in trouble. You need a consistency proof. And I should say, in fairness to Hilbert, almost everyone wanted a consistency proof. After the crisis of the Bertrand Russell paradox, people had been going about formulating set theory the modern guise of set theory, so-called ZFC, which was carefully designed to skirt around any known problems. But you'd want better than that. Really, I wanted a proof that it was consistent. Not just it avoids all known problems, but rather there can be no consistency problems. So everyone wanted a consistency proof. For Hilbert's program, absolutely crucial. It was part of the project. We have to have a consistency proof. And worse for Hilbert, he had to be, have a consistency proof that, for, for reasons I won't go into, that was finite. So it was only constructions of finite mathematics had to prove the consistency of the infinite stuff, but using only finite methods. That was his task. And as you can feel, there's something coming here. <laughs> there are problems with this. Gödel's first incompleteness theorem from 1931. He showed that there's a sentence in mathematics that such that if the system is consistent, that sentence is not a theorem, nor is it not a theorem. So what it means is there's a blind spot, if you like. There's a sentence in mathematics that just cannot be derived either way from mathematics. 
If it's consistent. If it's not consistent, then fine. All bets are off. But that's bad news for another reason, right? So just to give you a sense of what this sentence is like, very, very... Uh, again, I, unfortunately, I can't go into the details for reasons of time, but uh, ingenious way he, he coded this stuff up. He made a way of coding up every sentence of mathematics and giving them sort of numerical values for all of the propositions of mathematics. Incredibly non-trivial, used for all sorts of reasons all over the place in computing mathematics elsewhere. Very ingenious. Often skipped over as, oh yeah, of course you just give a name to everything, but you've got infinitely many of them. You've got to be very careful about how you assign the names. Devilishly clever what Gödel did here. That, that was just sort of one of the, the technical language he needed to get this up. But once you've done all that, and here I'll just wave my hands like everyone else is saying, once we've done all that devilishly clever stuff, you've just got a sentence of the form, I am not provable. Okay, now just think about that sentence. And you can, again, think back to the liar paradox, right? Gödel also, you know, philosophers are not alone in kind of worrying about such things. Gödel also worried about the liar. And this is where this came from, thinking about the liar paradox. I am not provable. Okay, think things through here. What if it's provable? Well, then it must be false, because it says it's not provable. So that's an inconsistency in the system. So if you can derive that sentence, if you can prove that sentence, your system's inconsistent. On the other hand, what if it's not provable? Well, then what it says is true. It's clearly true, but not provable. That's the only option left standing here, right? This sentence is true, but not provable in the system, if the system is consistent. Again, this makes it... So, that's, as I said at the outset, the basic idea of Gödel's is very, very simple. You know, this is the core idea. A lot of details to get this to work and the enco Gödel encoding and, and so on and so forth, but the basic idea is just ingenious. Just, you know, he'd been thinking about the liar paradox far too long. You know, <laughs> far too long for it to be healthy. Now, this is a problem for Hilbert, right? Because Hilbert thought that you could be able to recapture all of mathematics by playing this formal game, where the formal game is just manipulating symbols via rules. What Gödel showed is that there'll be blind spots. You're going to miss bits. If that's what mathematics is, it's going to miss things. That's bad for Hilbert, but Hilbert might shrug his shoulders and say, yeah, but that's bad for everybody, OK? Um, Second problem for, for Hilbert, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. He showed that uh, no consistent system can prove its own consistency. Modulo a few little uh, caveats here and there, but we won't need to go into the details. No consistent theory with a certain amount of mathematics, a certain amount of arithmetic, can prove its own consistency. This is... Absolutely devastating blow. Because again, remember what was happening at the time. We've got this crisis in mathematics. Mathematics had been proven to be inconsistent. Shock, shock waves went throughout all of mathematics and anyone who used mathematics. This was devastating. We never want this to happen again, was the, sort of the mantra. Working out new theories in ways that would never have these sorts of inconsistencies, but no one was completely confident because they always they thought that the original theory was fine until Russell came along as well. That looked like everything was hunky-dory there, but it wasn't. So they, while they were hoping that ZFC, the new theory, was consistent, no one was sure. And what you'd really want is a proof that it's consistent. What Gödel showed is, ain't no such animal. There are no consistency proofs. Unless it's inconsistent, then you can have it. But then it's kind of worthless, right? <laughs> so the basic idea, uh, I won't dwell on this, but the basic idea is if T is consistent, then G is not derivable in T. So T is just your mathematical theory. If this theory is consistent, then G, which is our Gödel sentence from before, right, the sentence that just says, I'm not derivable, then G is not derivable in T. And you can show, I won't bother with it, it's, it's, it's leave it as a homework exercise if you like, that given the previous...